the, guys, I don't believe in ghosts. Now, that's not to say I don't believe that there's something after this. After this shell we leave. But I don't believe that once I leave the shell, I'm going to come back here and talk to you about it. Because I've got bigger things to do, okay? You are listening to the best of ZTO TV podcasts February 2021 edition. As per usual we will be showcasing clips from the top 10 most downloaded episodes streaming right now on our podcast feed. Thank you for listening and enjoy the program. Coming in at number 10, Schlockfest episode 31 Innocent Blood. A classic 1992 John Lantis film is discussed. Is it a vampire film? Is it a gangster film? Is it a love story? You be the judge. This, this is where we meet Don Ricketts. Wait, I gotta backtrack one more. Oh, Jesus. Our other Jesus surprise Christ. cameo. Well, we haven't surprise. got there yet. We haven't got we there We have. Yet. No, we haven't. We haven't? No. We, we, okay. we, we, he, we, he just came back from the dead. He doesn't oh, run no. away yet, remember? He runs away, gets burned, goes into the freezer. That's where we meet cameo, too. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah so... Uh, so we don't really need to rewind it. Let me just pick up from where I left off where I was rudely interrupted. Uh, <laughs> butterflies. Butterflies. I, yeah. uh, anyways, so we, we meet the lawyer who is Don Rickles. Don Rickles finds that he isn't dead. He, he goes to hide him at his house because his thoughts are, and it's actually a pretty good mafia, m- mafia lawyer move. If they've declared you dead, Right, they can't search for your uh, search for you at the, at a home uh, because you're dead. So they wouldn't be able to use a warrant if he was at a house. All right, we we did we did miss cameo. What I the fuck said. are you talking about? <laughs> the coroner Relax. in this movie. Who the f- oh Jesus? Okay, yeah. See, you were you said two cameos though. I didn't, so I didn't plan for the third one. I didn't think it was worth mentioning, but it has to be right. worth mentioning. All right. So back up while we're while we think Robert Loge is dead on again, the table. Again, because, the because this is a John Landis movie and he used he used the same actor in yeah. American Werewolf in London as a doctor. He did. I guess he brought right. in this one's probably more important than the other one, but that's right. You, he brought you in. had me skip it, and it was a whole thing, and now we're fucking doing this. We're going. Frank yeah. Oz, damn it. <laughs> Frank Bobby Oz. Bear. That's right. So Frank Oz is the corner that declares uh, the guy dead to be dead. Robert Lozier yes. to be dead. <sighs> and they're, and they're going to cut him up? <laughs> they were going to cut him up, and he comes back to life and just McMurders everybody. Number 9, The Midnight Nexus, Episode 4, The Avid Reader by Bob Yates. In this episode of our science fiction horror audio anthology series the moral of the story is you can't judge a book by its cover. Jeff always liked Gus, but there was no denying the fact that he was strange. Gus was astoundingly smart and very soft-spoken, but he walked with a slight limp. He had been born with one leg longer than the other. And even though he wore glasses, his eyes tended to drift apart. Jeff always tried to take his break at the same time as Gus, because the rest of the guys in the warehouse usually wouldn't tease him as much if he did. But when they were separated, by scheduling or short staffing, Jeff would be forced to watch as Gus spent the back half of his break feeding the birds outside with seed he always carried in his pockets. And then when he came in to eat, the others would descend upon him like a pack of wild dogs. They called him vicious names, not only because he was deformed and cripplingly shy, but because of his book. For the last five years, Jeff worked with Gus. Gus always carried a huge green book everywhere he went. The binding and the cover were frayed and falling apart. The pages yellowed and uneven. But Gus didn't even go to the bathroom without it. If anyone ever came near to that book, Gus's face would change into a mask of pure hatred that Jeff could only describe as murderous. One time at break, Jeff asked what the book was about and extended his hand to touch it. 
gun snatched his wrist off the table with lightning speed and held it in a grip that felt like it could break bone. This book, he said calmly, but with a sinister shake in his voice, is my way out. My escape. The answer to everything. Please, Jeff, do not touch it. Unfortunately, Gus's protectiveness of the book and the fact that he had apparently been reading the same one for years proved to be an easy target for bullies. You still reading that same book? <laughs> they cried. How slow do you read? This month's eighth most popular release was Hillbilly Therapy, Quarantine Dating Advice for Incels. Hillbilly Therapy is our country fried advice show, a show for patriots who always aim for second string. Check out this fun clip. All right, first question. Since Valentine's Day is upon us, I've noticed my wife getting real bitchy about my sock laundry. I know it, and this says it here, stanks, with an A, it's fucking sock laundry, for God's sake. I don't know if she thinks all her sweet talk is going to land her a big old box of Russell Stover, but she'll be lucky to get flattened, warm, and melty York peppermint patty from the pocket, pocket of my jeans. I'm about to spit on this bitch. From some dude named Bitch Target in Bell Fountain, Ohio. There is so much to work with there. So much. What? What the yeah. fuck? Okay, first of all, I feel like more often in our podcast history, we have end up talking to not the person that sent the question. True. Uh, first of all, uh, this uh, wonderful woman, because uh, we we don't refer to them as bitches. Not anymore. <laughs> Not anymore. That's right. <laughs> but uh, uh, I'd leave his ass uh, first of all. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, what the? That's a. F- that dude went from like zero to one hundred and fifty in the midst yeah. of. Uh, Jesus Christ! That went. Now, from, that went from asking a question to I'm going to spit on my wife. Like yeah. whoa, whoa. <laughs> I'm I'm not a hundred percent sure that's a felony, but I'm pretty sure it's at least a domestic disturbance. It's gonna get you on cops. I know that minimum. Well, yeah, everything gets you on cops. Up next on the countdown, we have number seven: the true stories we just made up podcast. Confusing flags and sock law. Things get really weird on every episode of this complete nonsense fest. Check out this brief taste of Ray and New Farva talking about Ray's recent sock shopping faux pas. What's going on in your world? Well, I got kicked out of uh, Kohl's the other day for trying on socks. What? Yeah. Okay, this is... I, I don't know if I should be on your side or against, against well, you on this. Uh, you would think that, I, I mean, like, literally, they, they're they just... The socks are just out there, right, to try on, you would think. There's no, there's no sign that says don't try on the socks, right? No. So, anyway, I'm shopping <laughs> for some, some shirts and and stuff and i was like you know i could use some new socks and i get over to the the sock section there's a little goofy dude over here and he's folding (laughs) shit up and he's like can i help you a third and i went no no i'm just uh just looking for some socks i'm gonna try a few on he's like you can't try the socks on and i went oh okay Uh, he started to walk away and i'm like i'm fuck it i'm trying these socks on i don't care (laughs) so you know i don't like to wear socks if they're too tight, you know? Yeah, so, I get it. So anyway, so I, I get this, I find this really nice pair of going through. I've got, there's, there's like superhero socks. There's <laughs> your regular cotton socks. There's wool socks, right? I yeah. find this really nice pair of wool socks. Then they have these silk socks too. And I'm like, Ooh, I'm going to try these first. So right. I think I take my pants down. <laughs> Wait a minute. I, what? what? Uh, why? Why this? Why are you well, taking your fa- socks on? On your what? <laughs> on my drinkets. Coming in at number six, last roundup horror show episode 62 Digital Bugs, Hop Along Cassidy, Batman for Goths and Second Chances. Jason, John and Frank welcome new co-host and filmmaker Rob Avery to the show and the gang discusses four feature films, The Color Out of Space, Fade to Black, The Crow, and Phantasm Ravager. 
If you like a bunch of jackasses talking about horror then the last roundup horror show is definitely for you. Dog will hunt. Man, I'll tell you what, Nicolas Cage, <clears throat> he really shines in this movie. Uh, <laughs> he's got so many great yes. lines. Uh, like, uh, You don't get a lot of milk from alpaca. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, uh, boobs. <laughs> yeah. Boobs. And, uh, evidently, he was told to act, he was told to act like he did in uh, Vampire's Kiss, like totally unhinged and shit. So you get like uh, this kind of shit. Do me a favor and get the fuck out of my sight, okay? No, no. Actually, I'll save you the trouble and get the fuck out of yours. <laughs> Just like, what's that delivery? <laughs> um, yeah, he freaks out over he freaks out so many times in this movie. He freaks out over tomatoes. Uh, I was laughing at that. It's just it's thoroughly enjoyable to watch him break down. Um, I love that they made him an alp alpaca farmer. I don't know if that's true to the original story. It probably is, right? Uh, no, nah, no. Nah. Nah. I mean, I, I never read the story, but H.P. Lovecraft stuff. Mm -hmm. A lot of it tends to be short, like. Um, what from be from beyond was like just maybe three pages oh really a three page yeah like some of his some of his like like small stuff has been turned into feature things yeah I but i haven't really, read this one. you never see alpacas in a movie and that they made him a alpaca farmer who who's has who's ranting about how expensive they are it's just fun um i think the acting is great across the board the the the, the least equipped actor is tommy chong but he's fucking great he, I, I, <laughs> he almost uh, he's His character almost was legendary takes me, it <laughs> almost takes me out of it you know what it, I mean? He's oh, doing. Like, he's literally no, doing not, the best that it. he can. It's not because of the acting or anything, and it's it's my fault. But all I see when I see Tommy Chong is mm. Chong, and like I'm <laughs> I'm in this crazy horror movie, and all of a sudden he pops up. I'm like, what in the world is? This? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. that, had I not known who he was, uh, it would be fine. Like he he did great, but that's like what well, it, it kind of takes me out of it a little bit. <laughs> oh. <laughs> This month's fifth most downloaded release was once again the True Stories We Just Made Up podcast with their episode New Farva is Selling Dirty Panties. On this dumb episode Ray and New Farva welcome former ZTO radio co-host Scott Kramer to the show and some unsettling new business plans are revealed by New Farva. Just listen to this bullshit. The, I, we're trying to push forward uh, the proper puppy mill practitioners LLC. Uh, <laughs> we want to bring it back. You know, they've been. I understand why they've been closing up all the puppy mills, but the. I mean, think about the money that there is to make there, and if you do it properly, I'm just saying we get a bunch of cages, uh, six feet apart. You know, socially distanced, uh, one dog per cage. Still a mill, still the mill formula. Uh, but you know, really just people like puppies, you can sell them. They, they sell like dirty underwear. You know, you might say they sell like hotcakes. I say they sell like dirty women's underwear on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've been trying to get a puppy or not even, not a puppy. I want a regular dog that's already trained. <laughs> right. And though, I mean, maybe get... we could have that. That could be a service that we could provide for people. You know, I don't right. know. I'm sure, but I'm trying to get a dog and I don't understand how some people have like five dogs. Like, yeah. I can't even get one, and some some of you fucks out there are hoarding them. You, know? <laughs> you got to look for a sign alongside the road that says like AK, AKC certified, whatever. Give somebody eight hundred bucks. There you go. Right? You no. If so I was going to give $800, I'd go to a reputable source, not to your backyard. <laughs> I'll give you 250 for a backyard dog. Coming in hot at number four is our latest release from What the Fuck Did I Just Watch? In this episode, Jenny and Jean-Paul welcome one of Jenny's co-hosts on the Girls' Ghost Schools podcast, Betsy White, to break down the weirdest movie you'll ever see about a magical crab, Simply Irresistible. And then he goes into this lecture about the third date rule where like, you know, everything's fun, but after the third date, then it gets weird and people are trying to figure out if they're in a relationship or not. I'm like, okay, but why one is this girl after three dates downloading her schedule and two? Do you have to break up with someone after a third date or you just say, you know, this isn't working for me. We're not going to go on a fourth. I mean, are you in it? I don't. Does he no, bet him after the first or second date? And then on the third, he's like, he rates it and then goes, yeah, was it worth it? I mean, <laughs> I, I, I'm just curious. 
because that's just a weird number. It is. It's like, it's like, <laughs> like, is it really that fun on the third date? Is that like the the climax of a relationship? <laughs> it's obviously the pinnacle. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's rare that I ever made it to a second date, so I really have no opinion. On this. I find it kind of curious. I'm like, is, is this what normal people do? I don't know. <laughs> the top three spots were dominated by the Midnight Nexus. Episode one, Secrets and Caverns by Randy Woden came in at number three. Episode two, What Dreams May Change by Aaron England landed in second place and the number one release for February 2021 is The Ghost in the Warbot by Jacob Thornburg. Please enjoy this clip compilation from all three releases. She was now on solid ground, 50 feet into the earth. She got chills of excitement and a bit of danger. She flipped her headlamp on and pulled on the rope. All set, babe. On solid ground. Your turn. She yelled up. She could hear a faint response, but she already began to explore. The hole in the ground, the wound in the earth, opened to a cavern that looked like it had been carved into a giant cathedral. Huge pillars and columns stood before her, inviting her into a hallway. She knew she should probably wait on Charles. But he had already seen this place once. It was her time to explore with her own eyes. Each brick that made up the hallway floor was hand carved with what appeared to be some long forgotten language written on the top. She made her way forward. After a few minutes of stumbling through the long hall, the cavern opens once again to reveal what looks like giant pews carved of stone. And in the center, a stage, a giant stone stage, which hung a huge crucifix across the middle. She wandered closer to the ancient altar and turned her headlamp on the brightest setting she had available. She made a muted shriek from the back of her throat as she realized there's a skeleton hanging from this cross. From the look of the body, it wasn't ancient. The clothes suggested a fellow traveler or explorer. The chest cavity empty, ribs removed, and placed on the altar to spell some sort of ancient word. Her senses now overwhelmed her. I have to get out of here. Now. She started to back up quickly from the altar and turned to run. She ran right into Charles, right into his arms. Head and shoulder taller than she was, he held her tight as he spoke. It's an ancient native word for prosperity. Their gods were very generous. Well, <laughs> for a small price. He swept his hand quickly across her face and began to choke her into unconsciousness. An endless cornfield expands for what seems like an eternity on the other side of Redmond as he walks pointlessly down a potentially endless gravel road. The persistent fog making it difficult to gauge if there's an outlet to some main thoroughfare or if this is a path to some point of no return. Either way, Redmond has no idea how he got here or why he continues to walk this path, but it seems as though it's the only decision he can make. To walk or not to walk. To take the obvious path or to get lost for all of eternity in a quagmire of bad navigation by wandering off into the cornfield itself. He'll stay the course. He knows this is a dream. He hasn't had one in quite a while, but he recognizes the fuzzy remembrances. After what seems like hours, he reaches an old stump in the ground, with light shining down upon it, as though it were a holy place. A disembodied female voice calls out to him. Lay down your burdens. Have a seat. Redmond sits down on the stump and speaks to the voice. Who are you? Whoa. What is this place? A frustrated scowl forms on his face as he gets no response. He calls out once again. Show yourself. Tell me who you are. I want to know where I am. Tell me where I am. Redmond hears a shuffling beyond the mist. Something moving through the corn. He becomes unsettled stands up, ready to fight, 
should things go sideways. Quickly, his worried expression fades into comfort and love. Love engulfs his spirit as he sees his beautiful wife, Nancy, emerge from the rose. They run to each other and embrace. Let's sit down and I'll explain everything that's happening here, Nancy said confidently as she leads Redmond back to the stump. I mean, I've got to be dreaming here, right, Nance? I, I haven't dreamed in a long time. Uh, this could just be the result of some long-needed rest, or maybe I've crossed over to some other realm, but everything seems so real here, Redmond says in worried tones. Just sit down, buddy. I'll explain it all in due time. Nancy sits down on the old stump with Redmond. The couple look into each other's eyes with the same passion they shared the first day they met. Nancy's lips part to speak, and before she can utter one tone, one single syllable, a light from above shines down on both of them, brighter than the sun itself, and in a flash, both Redmond and Nancy become frozen in place as statues. This is their eternity, or this is Redmond's eternity. Warbots encounter heavy resistance as they move towards the place believed to be the leader's hideout. They eliminated almost a hundred enemy soldiers before they finally reach their destination. The Warbots only lose one more of their fellow bots along the way. All but one of the Warbots enter the structure. It stays outside to watch the perimeter and see if anyone is trying to flee. There were dozens of shots fired from inside over the next few minutes. Finally, a group of five men run out and climb into a vehicle. The warbot outside spots them and moves after their vehicle to stop their escape. They fire as the vehicle continues to accelerate. Warbot was able to dodge most of the fire, and it was almost 60 miles per hour when he began to gain on them. He registers the other warbots left the structure and were joining its pursuit. They were too far behind to be much of a help at the moment, though. It did not bother to return fire at the men in the vehicle. Instead, as it caught up with the vehicle, it reaches out with its metal fingers and rakes it across the rubber of the back tire. A popping sound ensues and the driver loses control of the vehicle. The jeep flips in midair. People inside fly. Left, right, center through the jeep's windshield. When the vehicle settles, the warbot approaches to make sure that none of the occupants were escaping. The other warbots finally catch up. They search for the men in the vehicle and confirm that the leader was amongst them. The warbot finds the man they are looking for. The man pleads for them to let him go. Letting him go is not in the warbot's programming. He sends a message to command letting them know that they identified the target. They sent the message back ordering to put the man down. The warbot follows his orders. It shoots the target twice in the chest and once in the head. He then confirms the target is neutralized. After this mission is done, one of them returns to the city to retrieve the shell of the other fallen warbots. Their secondary mission was to retrieve the tech whenever possible. They have a built-in timer that would activate an explosive code if the word was not entered within 30 minutes of severe damage. They had about five minutes to retrieve their tech and stop the countdown. With its fallen comrades in tow, it returns to the plane where all of the other warbots are congratulated by General Hertz on a job well done. For years, scenes like this go by. The warbots would be dropped into enemy territory. Fighting would ensue. They would clean up and return to their base. The most memorable battle after this one was when a warbot first encountered an enemy version of itself. They weren't exactly like him or his fellow warbots, but they were very similar. They were also much harder to kill than a normal soldier. But just like the human versions of the enemy, the Warbots were able to overcome them all eventually. They were upgraded to deal with these obstacles. 
Thinking was not something a warbot did. Its programming would not allow it outside of mission and parameters. But nevertheless, the warbot couldn't help but wonder why its creators were so bent on destroying themselves. There always seemed to be a new mission, more death, more destruction. When the last of the humans died, the warbot was deactivated. The last thing it saw was its creator's confusion at what had happened to the human race. The warbot itself had determined a long time ago that extinction of humanity was the only outcome of the fighting it had experienced over its years of service. It was ironic that the humans had not seen this coming themselves. It did not know how long it was deactivated, but when it was powered up by a rogue command, it only knew that it had received orders to track down the source of the commands. The warbot had to follow orders. That's what it did. It wondered, though, who could be sending orders now? Humans were gone. Warbots could not command other warbots. It accepted the mission and began on its way. It traveled many miles before finally arriving outside the coordinates it was sent. There, it simply discovered a highly advanced looking city. The warbot had not been ordered to eliminate anyone, so it simply walked through the city until it came to a building it determined to be the source of the commands. As it walked towards the source, it saw a holographic image of people flittering around the streets. Many of them seemed to be watching Warbot. The Warbot could not determine if they were frightened or just curious. Other holographs were going about what seemed to be like everyday human life. They were playing holographic games, dining in holographic restaurants, cleaning holographic plates. The place was definitely high tech, but it looked as if it had begun to fall apart. Structures looked as if they had not received any kind of upkeep or maintenance in many, many years. Thank you for listening to this month's edition of the Best of ZTO TV podcast. If you'd like to hear any of the full-length programs featured on this episode, just subscribe to ZTO TV Podcasts wherever you listen to audio entertainment. You can also subscribe to youtube.com slash zombie takeover TV for full-length video editions of all our shows.